Hello, everyone, and welcome to 15 Questions with an Archaeologist, brought to you by the National Park Service Southeast Archaeological Center. I'm Josh Guerrero, and I'm your host, and this is the show where we're trying to collect as many interviews as we can, where we ask 15 questions with an archaeologist. Each podcast episode will feature one archaeologist answering the same 15 questions. I think it's going to be fun, and we just might learn something. And joining me today, I have Michaela Mariello, who is one of the co-hosts of the I Dig It podcast, and is currently working in CRM at ACOM. So, Michaela, thanks so much for taking the time for joining me today, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, I've been looking forward to uh, chatting with you. I just uh, chatted with um, your co-host, Alyssa, um, a couple of days ago, and I got the two of you kicking off this uh, 2021 season of 15 Questions with an Archaeologist. And, um, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking, been looking forward to this because, um, you know, we have uh, a little bit of overlap in our experiences. You know, we, you and I were both uh, on the ground at York um, for a time, you know, doing some studying yeah. over there. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, but we'll get into that, of course, but just to kind of kick things off, I just want to, you know, learn a little bit more about you and, you know, what is it that you do um, over at ACOM and, you know, what is it that you kind of do as the co-host for the I Dig It podcast? Yeah. So at ACOM, I just started back in August, which is great, getting a job in the middle of the pandemic. Nice. Fun stuff. Well, congratulations. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) Um, It's my first real like CRM job because it's like they have me out in the field doing things, doing surveys, monitoring. And I'm just like, this is all news to me because I focus more on digital archaeology. So being on the ground doing actual field work is so exciting to me other than just like being on my desk and the computer doing all the digital stuff there is. And so it's been it's been a fun time so far. It's in a little slump right now because being a winter season, even in California, there's not a lot happening construction wise and all that fun stuff. But it's the perfect time to do surveys because everything is cold. There's no fires right ha- well, there actually is a fire in Southern California right now. Besides the point, <laughs> there's like <laughs> no real fires. It's not 100 degrees outside. So going out and doing surveys is ideal. Um, for the I Dig It podcast, this was an idea that I've had for a couple years now. Um, I kind of started at the beginning of the pandemic back in March, and I really wanted to start an archaeology podcast. And I was looking at microphones, wanting to start doing it, and like actually having a whole session, like a whole series, rather than just like making one, posting it on SoundCloud. And I was like, who, who can I do this with? I can't just do it by myself. I'm terrible at like keeping myself on track. And I was like, Alyssa, duh, like my best friend that I made at my master's. Okay. So then I messaged her saying, hey, what would you think about doing this? And she was totally for it. And we got started on that almost right away. And we like created all our social media accounts and got in touch with the Archaeology Podcast Network, like even before the first episode came out. And so with that, I also edit the podcasts and record them and all that fun stuff. And yeah. (laughs) Okay, cool. And it is helpful, I imagine, to have a co-host doing the podcast with you because, you know, I host uh, this podcast and um, I also host um, my uh, personal podcast that I run. And when you're doing it solo, it's like, not only are you the host, but you're also the editor, you're the producer, you're the marketer. (laughs) <laughs> just kind of, it's, it's a weird. lot of work. <laughs> and then it's just like, well, oh, I can just not do it. And then it's like a few months later and you're just like, oh, I forgot that I wanted to make this a series. Whoops. And then with the Archaeology Podcast Network, when they took us on, they're basically our producers now. And they like, we just give them ad space in our episodes and then they take it, they put us onto the website, put us on all the streaming platforms. It's it's so nice and so convenient that it's like, take so much pressure off my plate. And that just for me, it's just like setting everything up and editing and editing takes a few hours, depending on what happens. It's like, I can't even imagine how it is with videos and having to do all that too. So I'm just like, oh, that's a whole other spectrum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's, it's a little bit straightforward to um, more, more or less, I just got to overlay audio with uh, video and, you know, just some basic uh, software. So it's not quite as complex as like full-blown YouTubers who have like, you know, 
floating text and you know all these like effects and all that sort of stuff so yeah. but it, it's still either way though it still takes a good while so <laughs> it's just uh, so so yeah you kind of have a, have to have a little bit of a passion for this uh, yeah for, for for sure all right so you mentioned a little bit about digital archaeology mm -hmm. uh, in there and so that kind of makes me uh, curious to ask you this next question and that is if money were no object whatsoever what type of archaeology would you do? Do you think you would kind of focus more on this digital archaeology as you are now, or might you actually pursue something different? I think it would still be digital archaeology because there's still so much money that can be invested into it. Right. Especially, like, I go more into virtual reality and, like, video gaming, archaeo gaming. And so with that this costs a lot of money <laughs> and being able to <laughs> do a bunch of um, reconstructions, 3D modeling, and it can take a lot of time and a lot of labor involved and not just from the person like me, the individual, but like a whole team of people putting all this together. A lot of things can happen. And so having no, no budget limit, no money, Oh, that would be great. And especially with like underwater digital archaeology. Mm. That, that I think is the dream right there. I've never done underwater archaeology. That's always been a goal of mine. But that with the digital... It's at the tip top. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I, I would actually love to see some good digital reconstructions of like some of the shipwrecks that I've uh, yeah. dove in the past. That would be pretty amazing. <laughs> lots, lots, of, lots of, I think we're going to get some ideas coming forth in this yeah. conversation, Michaela. This, all right. Good. I like with um, good thing. Back and forth right here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Right on. All right. So, but what I have for you next is um, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, your education. You know, we've, uh, as we mentioned at the start of our conversation that, you know, we were both spent some time uh, in York studying there. So tell us a little bit more about, what your education journey has been like, uh, where have you uh, studied, and why have you chosen to study at the locations that you went to? So I guess starting with my bachelor's, I guess. I guess that's the first degree. Yeah. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so I went to my bachelor's right out of high school. I went to California State University, Long Beach in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically I went there because it was the easiest option for me because of the Cal Grants and FAFSA and stuff like that. And I'm like, for a bachelor's, I would want to stay more local and like, I don't want to take out loans for it basically. And I knew the Cal State Long Smart Beach move. had a good <laughs> anthropology program. Yeah, I was like, for a bachelor's, eh. but for everything else after that, oh yeah, I'll take out money if I can't get funding. And like, 18 year old Michaela just didn't know anything about funding or anything like that. Cause my high school, like, didn't tell us anything about anything about college so it's just like okay let's go off into the world yep go have spread fun. your wings it's like <laughs> what wings we have wings that's insane and so i went to cal state long beach and they had an amazing i really liked their anthropology program and so that's why i started to pursue them and i went in there into archaeology and kind of was dissuaded because of the lectures and just didn't work out too well um, so I went mainly into virtual anthropology, sorry, visual anthropology. So with that, I was going more visual side and making films, podcasts, uh, 3D film, or not, sorry, not 3D, 360 films, and just being able to discover anthropology in that light. And then I was thinking of, this would be so interesting as archaeology i don't know if this exists like you see like those 3d reconstructions of these old sites and everything and you can have those like fly overviews but i haven't seen anything vr related like this would be really cool in vr and i was on um i went on a field school in bulgaria in 2017 like right before i graduated from my undergrad it was like graduating in december 2017 so this was uh, July to August and on the way there I went into Bulgaria I took two weeks prior to that and I traveled around like Eastern Central Europe just because it's like oh just like a little road trip I'm gonna take myself to Bulgaria <laughs> my brother came along with me taking little sister to school and he was asking me all these like archaeology questions being like why do you want to go into archaeology I'm like I don't even know this is kind of like my last effort like do I actually want this? Should I go more anthropology? And then I had this like brain blast of 
I'm going to look up virtual reality and archaeology and using it in museums and archaeological sites, yada, yada. And so I did that. And the first thing that came up in my Google search was the University of York. And so then that's when I looked into the program. I was like, this is insane. This is their digital heritage program for archaeology. And the, the, the director at the time, Dr. Sarah Perry, was the her email was there, so I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send her an email. I've just found this program, I'm, I'm very interested. So I sent an email being like, this is what I'm interested in, how is this looking for this university, is this what this program offers? A, like immediate response within like the next day. Obviously it helps because I was in Europe at the time, so it's like the, um, the time change was fine. <laughs> the time difference, there we go. And she was saying, yeah, that sounds exactly what this program has to offer. And then we kept corresponding and a few months later got accepted to the University of York. And then I went on from there, <laughs> just right out of my undergrad, well, a year later from December, but yeah. Right. Well, you, you, you're, you're definitely in good hands because, you know, Sarah Perry's amazing and, you know, she, she's been a guest on this podcast before and her and I have uh, became friends uh, since uh, my time at York as well. So you definitely in good hands. And, yeah. you know, and, and I think um, she, she's actually transitioned. I think she's at Museum of London Archaeology now. So they got a valuable asset um, yeah. under their wing now. So, so good I'm so proud that. of her. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right on. All right. So uh, very cool. So you, you've, uh, you've come a long way. And of course, you've gotten to study in some pretty amazing places. You know, you also mentioned field school in Bulgaria, and then of course, your time at York. So I'm curious to ask you about some of the most interesting uh, sites that you've gotten to work on so far. And I guess I could apply this question to either sites that you have physically went to and were, you know, uh, uh, digging at, or maybe sites that you've gotten to work with uh, in the realm of creating digital uh, archaeology as well. So what, what kind of uh, comes to mind? I, I really want to say Bulgaria. And I don't know if it's just like a bias, no, I guess not a bias. It's like I spent the most amount of time there because I was there for a month, which I guess is kind of not that long. But when you're, when you're there, it's your first like real field experience. Yeah, um, it goes by quick though. You're right. Yeah, so. It really does. It's like, <laughs> wait, it's already over. And since it's split up sometimes in like two weeks and two weeks, or you can sit whole four weeks that the first two weeks people just kind of come and go. Then there's like another two weeks and you're just like, who are you people? This is fun though. But that one was definitely my, I think it was my favorite. It was my most educational. It really gave me a look into the field. I got to do all sorts of things with waking up at six in the morning, going into the field, digging and the trenches and working on this hilltop site in Bulgaria. And it had one of like the oldest preserved wattle and daub walls in the region. And it was, this was really amazing. And I think also the directors that were there really set the tone because you can have like really good directors or like ones that are a little bit stricter. And I haven't had like a really strict director, but I've heard stories. Oh, I've heard stories. I'm sure you have as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're just really cool because they're just like, yeah, take the pictures you want. Like, everything that you're finding is your effort into this. Like, this is your project, too. And I'm like, I'm nothing. <laughs> it's like, who am I to this project? This is my first time here. You guys have been here for five years. And so doing that, and then at, the, at that site, they're actually doing photogrammetry of all the layers and artifacts that they're finding which is exactly what I was looking into for the program at York. And I was just like, this is, this is it. This is my sign. This is where I'm going to go. And just being there, learning about all these different artifacts and all the processes of um, anal analyzing them. And after we would be in the field for the morning to the early afternoon, we would be going into the lab after lunch. And then in the lab, we do all like the cleanup and taking photos categorizing everything and just setting everything up and ready to be um, sent to the next step, which was at the universities nearby in Bulgaria. And just being a part of that whole program was really cool to me. 
Yeah, sure sounds like it. Oh, that, that, that's that that's amazing. So, all right. Well, dialing things in a little bit. Um, I want to ask you about artifacts uh, next. You know, mm -hmm. th I'm sure th this is usually the question that I'm sure you know most people want to know. Like, what's the coolest artifact that you ever found? Right. So, I will ask on their behalf. Uh, what are some of the most coolest artifacts that you've ever uh, recovered or, or worked with? <sighs> That's always the question. <laughs> it's like I've I really wanna say the um the coolest artifact was I think just like being there and like digging things up and especially in Bulgaria like you're digging things up, you're going like layer by layer mm -hmm. and you find like an almost intact cup and you're just like this is amazing. You want to hold it by the handle and pretend you're like sipping tea out of it, but you're just like, <laughs> this is like thousands of years old. Somebody was using this. Somebody was sipping their tea and just kind of being transported back into the past and just imagining this whole entire site as it once was, as you can, as you would imagine it. Like, this is how it's supposed to look like. This is what we think it looks like. And then just seeing some random person there just sitting with the cup and then just, yeah, that was cool to me. <laughs> It's like, it's, it's simple, but for me, that was my biggest. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean and how f unearthing artifacts like that kind of have that sort of, um, I'm not even sure, like, how, how, to, how to describe it. It's like, uh, but as you were kind of describing that, I was sort of thinking of when I was in northern New Mexico in the Santa Fe National Forest, I found a piece of, uh, it, it was an obsidian projectile point. And I'm thinking to myself, man, it, what was it like for whoever just, you know, just chipped away at this thing to form this projectile point and maybe lashing it to, um, uh, to form an arrow and having it like notched on, on, on a bow to go hunt. And I'm thinking, this is really cool. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's really cool. Yeah. When you kind of transport yourself and travel back in time, uh, figuratively speaking, of course. Yes, of course. And so, so yes, I, I certainly uh, can relate. Uh, that's very cool. Uh, right on. All right. So but shifting gears uh, a little bit, um, I want to talk a little bit about mentorship because, you know, as you and I were talking about our journey as uh, students, you know, mentors were very critical to our journeys and the development of ourselves as archaeologists. So um, and you, you mentioned uh, Dr. Perry, but who have also been some of your, your mentors and how have they kind of influenced you along the way? I would have to say I have two mentors. One was from my undergrad, and that was Dr. Stephen Rousseau Schindler, and he was the visual anthropologist that is at the university. He really helped me be validated with my work and just giving me that confidence, helping me obtain my confidence in what I was doing and being like, this, these are great ideas, like really just guiding me, being asking me questions of what I was doing and just being there for me as well. And just that was really my first mentor that really like stuck by me through everything. And we still are in touch and everything and catching up with each other. And he's just like, I'm just so, he's, he's so proud of me. So I was just like, <laughs> I'm so happy. I got to read like his letter of recommendation that he sent to the University of York and it made me cry. And he was just like, I've never written a, <laughs> like a letter of recommendation this well before at that time, at least this is like back in 2017. Who knows? He's, he's an amazing professor and I, I adore him because <laughs> he's just, so out there with his work and his line of thinking and everything that he does where it makes you want to be more than what you are. And then my second was my supervisor at York, Dr. Colleen Morgan, and her digital work is phenomenal and I loved being under her and learning with her and through her. And she also helped me being able to think broader and more of like what I wanted to do with my master's dissertation and just being there to answer every question and just definitely somebody to look up to in a new country and she's from the states as well so yeah. she definitely mm -hmm. knew like the struggle of going abroad and being in a whole different country even though it's like it wasn't that much of like a culture shock but it's still like away from home so yeah those are my two big ones. Yeah, right on. And yes, uh, Colleen Morgan is 
absolutely uh, brilliant. Um, I just remember seeing some of uh, her uh, visual renderings of Chetelhayok, and I'm just like, oh man, <laughs> this looks amazing. So, and then uh, I did have her for one of my uh, skills module. I, I was in the um, uh, field archaeology program, so mm -hmm. so yeah, I did take a skills module with her, and was really insightful. And I really liked uh, you know how she went about you know, conducting the course. So solid mentor to have uh, for sure. So yeah. awesome. All right. So shifting gears yet again, um, these few questions here are definitely like, you know, shifting gears. I want to ask <laughs> you about like, uh, um, you know, because you've had some experience here in the States, you've had some experience in the UK and in Bulgaria, albeit maybe uh, shorter than some of your other places you've been to. But um, what country out there do you think kind of sort of handles um cultural like uh resource management and archaeology the best like who just seems to get it or like maybe have you not had like the, uh, the the amount of time that you've been to each of the places you've been to has it maybe not been enough to actually get a full sense of the picture of what it's like there um but well i'm curious as to what your thoughts are on that i would think for bulgaria i did not have enough time to fully gauge uh i went through the Balkan Heritage, Balkan Heritage, Balkan Heritage Association or Society, and that was just a small uh, private sector that did archaeology. So that's about all I know for the Bulgarian archaeology off the top of my head. But between the U.S. and U.K., which I can talk about more, I it's a little difficult because with the u.s there's like a lot of newer laws that are being enacted because i guess like sure oh, I yeah guess things past uh modern u.s history are important i guess we should care about the indigenous people so all these like newer laws that have become enacted are very important and i love still i'm learning more and more about them every day especially like out in the field like working with people who have been in crm way longer than i have and just learning under them and i'm just like please teach me more <laughs> and it's like i want to learn like just do, like tell me to do whatever i'll do it and i want to say that with that and the uk i want to say that the uk i feel like still has a little bit better than the us as of right now especially with uh just all of the um, the buildings and the building laws that I'm totally blanking on the names of. Um, just the inability of being able to just go in and bulldoze buildings wherever they please because they want to build something new. It's like, no, you have to actually go through the city. You have to go through everything in order to get the permits to do that. And maybe you can, maybe you can't. And just at such a historically driven island country that it's like you can't do too much, but you still need to be able to live and continue digging and um, working on the land as well. And so that I think the UK wins for me yeah. as of right now. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, in the UK, there's always going to be something to do within the realm of, you know, you know, cultural resource management and, and archaeology. I mean, it's yes. just it, as much work as they, that they've that's been done there over the years so far. I mean, they're barely scratching the surface. So yeah, <laughs> but but yeah, they they have done really well. I've noticed that not only with just like yeah the the laws that they have in place, but also just like and maybe you probably noticed this too, but just how involved the public was too with like every single aspect of like you know heritage and archaeology within the country as well. So. Yeah. I know that in York, when they're digging up the old um, Viking settlement on Coppergate, I think that was like the street in just downtown York or mid, like middle of York, they had like everything blocked off when they were doing the dig and the excavation and everyone was just so excited and everyone would be around the archaeologists as they were digging and just being fully enthralled with it. And now with the Jorvik Museum, just this whole like immersive experience into what York used to look like and it's like a whole like ride that's there and it's like you just sit in this little buggy and then it just takes you around gives you all the, like the nice nice smells mm -hmm. smells pretty funky <laughs> <laughs> and just people are enthralled with like learning about York's history especially yeah now, now speaking of uh, the Jorvik Center um wh when were you on uh the ground in York like what years were you, were you there 
I was there 2018, 2019. Okay. So, so fairly recently. So the Jorvik Center was open, I'm assuming, while, while you were yes. there because uh, I was there from 2015 to 2016. And um, for around Christmas time in 2015, there was this major flood that flooded like much of York. And, and basically the uh, Jorvik Center was closed for pretty much just about a year like uh following that because it took that much to because you know it's underground of course and so it took that it took that much to clean it out and get it ready but fortunately i had visited the place before that it happened so yes i got to see the uh i got to ride the ride and smell the smells that you described but (laughs) but 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 now upon hearing your story i'm glad they're operational again so because that was an amazing place so at least they had been doing fantastic i don't know what's happening right now because of COVID. So, mm-hmm. but, but crossed, they're all good. Yeah, but hopefully, no, no, per, it sounds like no permanent damage from the floods, though. So, no. okay. All right, cool. It, it looks pretty Ooh. cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cause that, that was a cool place. And I, I definitely enjoyed that uh, for sure. All right. So, what I have for you next is I want to ask you a little bit about uh, volunteers. Um, have you had much chance to work alongside volunteers in places you you've been to, or maybe even had opportunities to uh, be a volunteer yourself at at some digs? Uh, what does that look have that looked like for you? I was a volunteer at the campus for Cal State Long Beach uh, in 2016. They were doing this reburial project on the actual campus grounds because the campus is built on native grounds and so Mm. there's this big convoluted history with this project itself that it will take like a million years to tell (laughs) but um (laughs) eventually like it took them years to be able to finally get some archaeologists on the ground in order to start doing like a little bit of digging just to see if anything was in this particular spot while they're getting everything ready for the reburial and i volunteered my time because i was like yay experience yay free experience (laughs) it was um a couple months there and it was just on the campus i was able to go home come back just easy peasy and that was really cool um only found some shells it was just a little midden pile but it was really cool like that was my first like real like actual digging experience and then i so there i also worked along other volunteers because everyone just there to help out and be a part of the team in the archaeology department it was like a small little team maybe there was five or six of us per session and then in bulgaria too that was there were volunteers there i don't know if like i guess field schoolers count as volunteers just paying volunteers like, yeah yeah well we'll yeah, go okay. with that <laughs> okay um but for there there were volunteers from the universities of um new New Sofia uh, University in Bulgaria and Sofia and they came down with the Bulgarian team and then there's also a German team because the two directors were from Bulgaria and Germany and the team from Bulgaria there was volunteers just to help out and be there and get some credit I don't know if they got credit but they just got the experience of being there and they're just happy to be there there are just like, I don't know, everyone who I've worked with has just been re- really eager to be on site with everyone, just been very easy to work with, and everyone just flows together. And so that was my experience with volunteers. All right, really cool. All right, so the next couple questions that I have for you, this is getting to what I say is the core of what it means uh, to be an archaeologist. And the first of those two questions is, what is just the best part about being an archaeologist? just being there and just like I, I said earlier as well it's you're transported transported trans yeah transported into like the past and yeah <laughs> you're able to help see like the bigger picture and just being a part of what's going on being able to learn about the site the people artifacts what things were used and reused for and to me that's what it is with being an archaeologist you're learning you're always learning every nothing i guess it's like you expect something but sometimes you don't get what you expect and that's the most exciting part every everything is an adventure and so you just get to go and learn and 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a difficult it, question. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, well, th- there's, there's a lot of great things to this, uh, lifestyle, uh, for sure. And, and, and also you make an interesting point about how you're always learning is because basically when you make the decision to become an archeologist, you're basically becoming a lifelong student basically because the field the the career field is constantly changing you know there's everything from new laws to new technology to new methods new theories and the works and um my supervisor uh retired earlier this year and i remember like having a conversation with him and i said and i asked him i'm sure probably even now sir as you're getting close to retirement there's probably still a lot of things that you you know probably don't know and are still learning he's like mm, yeah that's basically how it goes so yeah. but but it, it's it's an exciting part of it too to always just kind of just see your growth as you go so mm-hmm. <laughs> for sure yeah all right but on the flip side though what would you say is the worst part about being an archaeologist I feel like the inconsistency and with, especially on the job market, how there might be jobs, there might not be jobs. It's kind of about who you know to help you get into where you want to be. And for that, it's a little bit difficult, especially if you don't have that sort of background. And especially if you're just coming into archaeology is like fresh out of your undergrad or fresh out of your master's. And it's like, okay, I've just been all my time to going to field schools and education, working, like I, I've made connections. How do I use these connections and just figuring out how to juggle networking with trying to find a job in your field. And I feel like that for me has been the hardest part. <laughs> yeah. It's tough to get traction at first uh, when, yeah. you, when you're, when you're starting now. And yeah, I've, I've experienced that. It's been a lot of, you know, temporary positions, seasonal term positions, you know, and you may be at that for a while before you find something a little bit more permanent. And then of course, you know, you know, you're, you're kind of been like, you know, the private sector, I'm in the federal sector. So you got those different avenues that you can choose too. So it's a, uh, yeah, it can, it can be a bumpy start <laughs> to say yeah. the least. So yeah. for sure. All right. So what I what I have for you next is this is a tribute to the right stuff, which is a wonderful novel written by Tom Wolfe. I would like to ask you, who is the greatest archaeologist that you have ever seen? That's a question. There's just so many archaeologists, and like with all the different sites out there, it's hard to attribute the works of looking at an entire site to one person but i would have to say right now is maurizio forte and he does really amazing virtual reality and virtual reality virtual archaeology work mainly and he's been writing about this since the 90s since kind of like the beginning of virtual archaeology itself and just his visualization of how this virtual and digital world that we are now living in is going to be affecting archaeology and how it has affected archaeology. And he continues publishing articles and books and just being like, okay, so we talked about cyber archaeology back in the 90s. Now let's redefine this now and what does it mean? And to me, that type of mentality and that type of work of being able to notice these changes over the last few decades and still writing about them and being eager to continue forward with these ventures in the digital world instead of being like, no, no, we have to go back to how the digital archaeology was in the 90s or like that and just staying like that. It's like, no, we have to progress forward because the world is always changing. So with that, Forte is definitely the top of my list right now. Okay. All right. Very, (laughs) very, Very good. All right. So what I have for you next are a couple of fun questions. And these are questions that I'm sure all archaeologists have been asked at one point in time. So you're going to get asked uh, these as well. And the first of those is, have you ever found a dinosaur? Yeah, no, I can't say that I have. (laughs) Much to a lot of people's dismay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, well it, it sounds like in that case you were doing everything in the field correctly because if you did find a dinosaur you probably dug too deep so. <laughs> probably oh you're not just supposed to dig straight down oh you have to go on the oh, 
silly, Michaela. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to take off layers a little bit at a time, you know. <laughs> oh, man, I gotta go back. <laughs> I gotta go back to school yeah, we, for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You might have to go back to Bulgaria, which actually might be kind of nice. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it wasn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> all right. All right. So the next question that I have uh, going along these same lines, and that is, uh, how do you feel about Indiana Jones? Uh, um, movies. All right. They're they're cl cult classic. Indiana Jones himself is a doctor. Uh, I'm not a fan of him or his work. <laughs> like who just goes in and you just i know it's the 40s 40s were a different time now we have new laws but what what would it like have him just go into these areas and just start taking things and it's like oh and also taking the women with them being like you like me right <laughs> and <laughs> just being like oh by the way this artifact it belongs in a museum it's like no no it doesn't Yes. So those are my opinions of Indiana Jones. Not, yeah. And, the biggest fan. <laughs> yeah. And when, and when I was uh, asked this question to um, Alyssa, it was, uh, and I'm like, and, and every place Indiana Jones gets destroyed. It's like every temple he visits, it gets destroyed. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. everything's getting blown up or destroyed. <laughs> yeah. you, did, did he even document anything or did he just go in being like, oh, this is supposed to be right here and then take it, then everything just explodes? <laughs> <laughs> so. It's like, uh, what about it, though? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, good, entertaining, you know, action yeah. and, and adventure uh, franchise uh, films. But I mean, uh, I, I don't, I don't think like, um, you know, if we're gonna go to field school, I don't know if we should use those movies as like, you know, teaching aids. So. <laughs> Maybe not. But I would say that they are good. Te not a teaching aid, but getting people to look into archaeology. Be like, I'm a kid. I want to be an archaeologist, and then that was their first introduction with archaeology. It might just not be as romanticized as that. But it's pretty cool. And I'm totally biased by saying that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and then, you know, I, I'm, I'm a fan of Harrison Ford. And, you know, if we got Harrison Ford representing archaeology in a matter of speaking, hey, I'm all for it, too. So I'm not I'm not opposed. <laughs> All right. Uh, very, very cool. And, um, you know, I'm sure we could probably get down a whole rabbit hole of, you know, archaeology and media and pop culture. But, um, for, but um, I got a couple more questions that, that I want to ask you, Michaela. And this is kind of sort of, eh, I guess I'd say wrapping up on a serious note. And the first uh, question that I have for you wrapping up is, what advice would you give young people or maybe just even anyone for that matter who may be uh, seeking to make a career in archaeology? I would have to say just don't give up. It can be daunting at times and seemingly hard and you can might catch up on little hurdles in the road. But I mean, life itself is a roller coaster. There's ups and downs. If it was just a single straight line, right. what's, what is there? So what that goes with also archaeology, you might have professors that you really enjoy and that really get you riled up for archaeology and those just might dissuade you from archaeology and those are from my experiences but from that I was able to find what I really enjoyed with it and I just like had that like light bulb moment I just like zoomed on forward and so just keep with the momentum and keep with yourself and you know yourself more than anybody else knows you and just keep moving forward with it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's great advice, not only in archaeology, but in life as well. So I appreciate that. Right on. All right. And uh, the last question that I have for you, and this is a pretty big one, too. What can the general public do to help protect archaeological sites? Well, it's not like you can tell people to not go to places, especially when they're visitor centers and everything, but just doing your part and keeping on trails, not littering, and being there to just see the site, but don't try to go into it or destroy it, vandalize and all that, all that jazz. And just help with the donations to keep the site and keep the site, uh, helping the pres preservation of it. And that, I think. I think that's all I have with the public. <laughs> yeah, you know, leave, leave leave no trace, basically, you know, yeah. which is, you know, pretty straightforward, you know, on any sort of like uh, public lands out there that you would go visit. So for yeah. sure. All right, right on. 
All right. Well, Michaela, that's it. That's all uh, 15 questions all, um, all wrapped up. But before we close out here, uh, where can our listeners go to uh, connect with you? You know, you're kind of out there in the social media uh, space. And, and of course, you got the podcast out there, too. So where can, you know, our listeners go tune in uh, to that? So, you know, websites, you know, social media, basically an elevator pitch if you had to give one on, on this. So what do you got? <laughs> Um, tune in to the I Dig It podcast. Uh, new episodes come out every other Fridays. You can find us at the archaeologypodcastnetwork.com slash I Dig It on our Instagram, I Dig It Podcast, and Twitter at I Dig It Podcast as well. You can also shoot us an email at I Dig It Podcast at gmail.com. Then you can find me personally on Twitter at M underscore Mariello and Instagram at MM underscore digitalized. Okay. I'm glad to see that you came ready with those. So, right on, <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah. so and, and I'll also have uh, all of those uh, linked up in the show notes for our listeners can go and find it there, make it nice and uh, quick and convenient uh, for them. All right. Well, Michaela, I want to thank you very much uh, for taking the time uh, for joining me today. It's been great to getting to connect with you, also getting to connect with uh, Alyssa as well. You know, you both are doing uh, great work, so keep it up. And uh, thank you so much for being here and sharing all this with myself and the listeners. You know, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful ta talking with you. All right. Absolutely. Right on. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at NPSCAC. That is at N-P-S-S-E-A-C. And be on the lookout for more episodes of 15 Questions with an Archaeologist dropping at the first of every single month. And please remember that since we work for the government, we spell archaeology without the A and the E, so it's just a little bit different when you read it in the title. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I'm Josh Guerrero, and I'll see you in the next episode.